All right, good morning, church. It's good to see you. Will you stand with us? We're going to sing a little bit. Lord, we're so grateful we can celebrate you this morning. Focus on you. celebrate this morning. We can lift our voices because we have a God who loves us and cares for us. You're perfect in all, the, all that you do. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are, for saving us. Amen to that, right, church? Well, welcome. Welcome to Aspen Ridge, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching at home. It's an amazing time and day and age that we can uh, be unified and, and stand under that banner of Jesus Christ, even if we're socially, physically distant from each other, right? And uh, we can still be that church. And so I'm grateful for everybody who's watching and everybody who's here lifting your voice in person. Um, before we go any further, to be that church that God's called us to be, I think it's important for us to be communicating and connecting at this time. So if you're here in person, 
in that worship folder, you'll see that communication card. And that's a way for you to update us on anything that's going on in your lives or let us know if there's any prayer requests. If you're at home, the Aspen Ridge website has that contact us tab in the top right corner. And we would love to hear from you who are at home. Maybe we haven't seen you in a couple of weeks or months because of the whole COVID stuff. But we would love to know if there's any updates or life changes going on or if there's anything we as a church can be praying for. To be the church, I think it's really important for us to be communicating during this time. So let's keep that in mind. Um, Before we go any further, before we lift our voice and sing a little bit more to a God who's absolutely worthy, let's look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. This says simply that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And Lord, we just take a moment and pause and acknowledge you've been there for us. You are the God who exists outside of time. You have been there at the beginning and you will be there at the end. You were good to us at the beginning of our lives and you will be good. We have a hope. We put our faith in the fact that you will be good to us tomorrow. And then the day after that and the day after that and the week after that, Lord. We thank you that you communicate, that you love us. We can celebrate that there is a God who cares and he stands the test of time. Thank you, God. There is none like you. Turn our focus and our attention on you. God of it all. Fire in my bones, like a whisper to my 
thank you for who you are and the word that stood the test of time. you are there for us in our time of need. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Church, you may have a seat. Hey, Aspen Ridge. I wanted to follow up and say a huge thank you for all that participated with Aspen Hollow Trunk or Treat. You guys, this was the biggest outreach Aspen Ridge has ever done. 
and we just really needed this at this time. We had 30 trunks that were beautifully decorated, so thank you so much for having those trunks. We had a whole security team directing traffic, and it went so smoothly because of them, so thank you, security team. And we had more candy donations than we've ever had. So for all of you who participated in that, thank you so much, because we used it all. We had over 200 cars come through, and we're estimating about 800 people came through. And also a huge shout out and a huge thank you to the Salida Circus, who are amazingly talented and made this event even more special. And friends, I just want to tell you how amazing Aspen Ridge is because in this year of COVID and everything's so weird, um, so many people stepped up to make this possible and this was something that everyone really, really needed. The goal of this event was to have a fun, safe event and bring joy to our community and friends, we did it. So thank you so, so very much and God bless you. Mwah. I just noticed it says Bruce Chaffer Elder Board, but uh, I am uh, I am no longer on the Elder Board this year. Um, but uh, that's a, just a small correction. Um, uh, what a blessing the uh, the outreach was! Thank you, thank you for uh, joining us this morning, both here and online. It's a blessing for God's people to get to to gather and to uh, celebrate uh, being part of His body, and uh, that's what we seek to do here today. This morning I'll be reading from, I'll be reading Esther chapter 10, the last uh, chapter in the book of Esther. And uh, would you stand with me as we uh, read God's, as I read God's word. <clears throat> King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea. And all the acts of his power and might and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai to which the king advanced him are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers. For he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. Thank you. Please be seated. And would you join me in prayer? 
Oh, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God, we come into your presence. We acknowledge your presence that has been here with us um, as we gathered in this morning. But God, um, calm our minds this morning. Make us aware of your presence. Make us aware of your watch care over us, your love, your steadfastness, your, um, your truth, the peace that you can bring on our hearts because of your presence and the greatness of your being. God, you are God. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen us in your word as your word comes to us today. Open our hearts. Let us learn. Let us change. Let us be what you would have us be here on earth among our neighbors. God, I thank you for the uh, Operation Christmas Child I thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, send these boxes out. And God, I pray for the children that will receive these boxes. I pray that you would let their heart, open their hearts and let them see that these are just a small token of the love that you have in Jesus Christ. Let them, um, let them hear about you. Let them see you in this, in this process. Lord, let them be blessed. Let your name be lifted up in it. Lord, as Chris brings us your word this morning, I pray blessing on, on him, and I pray uh, uh, our hearts be open. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we, we have the, uh, uh, the blessing of having uh, Chris Vanen Wagen uh, speak to us this morning. He is a, uh, a brand new uh, member of our elder team, and uh, we, are, uh, we are blessed to have him here today. Chris, would you come and bring us God's word? Thank you. Thank you. I still have trouble with my name, too. My last name. <laughs> it's a doozy. Well, good morning to all of you. Glad to see you out there today and that you made it here on this blustery morning. Uh, it's kind of cold out there with the wind blowing, but um, glad to have all of you that are online watching us this morning too, and hope you are blessed by the message that our Lord has for us this morning. Um, before we begin, could we just have a word of prayer asking for God's direction? Our Father, we are so thankful that we can come here today have the privilege of being in your house. And we just ask as we're opening your word and looking at this ancient document that um, you might open our eyes to what you have to teach us and our hearts to the righteousness that is displayed in the life of Mordecai this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Well, this week we're going to be wrapping up the book of Esther. We've got... Uh, only three verses in this, this chapter, and you are going to be amazed at how much we can get out of three verses this morning. Well, I think that this story is akin to one of the um, ancient epics that we, we can read. Uh, I've got one that I'm looking at from Ireland called the Tain. I don't know if anybody's ever read that one. I'd never heard of it before. But usually there's this problem that arises and uh, we have some kind of a difficult situation and then you have in the plot these twists and turns back and forth. And then you have the protagonist who ends up winning in the end in some extraordinary way. So it's very much like those ancient epics, except that this story is true. It actually happened. Well, undoubtedly, as we've looked over the past few weeks, and Pastor has uh, shared the book with us, the key verse that we can pull out of this scripture is found in chapter 4, verse 14. And it reads like this. 
For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance from the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position at such a time as this. This is Mordecai speaking to Queen Esther, telling her, you need to do something. Well, the verse speaks to what I understand to be the underlying main theme or the, I guess you'd say the big idea of this whole book, and that is the providence of God. Well, what does providence mean? Well, one definition I saw that I really liked that said it is the foreseeing care and guidance of God over his creation, and in this case, over his people. Now, Pastor Jeff has indicated before that God is not mentioned in this book at all. Every other book in the Old Testament, God is mentioned numerous times, but not in this one. Isn't that interesting. And yet, um, in the underlying events that take place, uh, the threatening of the Jews, God is in control of the whole thing. He's controlling the events for his own people which in this case ultimately is for their salvation and for the protection of the Jewish people. So we see here God at work behind the scenes to bring about his purpose. Uh, um, as I was doing my research here for this topic, one pastor wrote this about it. He said, theologically, providence is the direction that God gives to everything animate and inanimate, good and evil. Practically, the providence is the hand of God in the glove of history. And that glove will never move until he moves it. God is at the steering wheel of the universe. Providence means that God is behind the scenes shifting and directing them. He stands in the shadows, keeping watch over his own. Well, as we look at the remainder of the chapter, uh, this remaining chapter of Esther, we're viewing the providence of God at work in the lives of the Jews who are in exile, and specifically the life of Mordecai. Now, this is an interesting book because it's the only one that is written about the Jews and by the Jews who are not in the land of Israel. They're in a foreign land. And uh, it is something that's taking place with a group of people who are members of this great exile where the people were brought in chains from the land of Israel and Jerusalem was destroyed. This is that group of people. Well, let's see how it plays out. In chapter 10, it's interesting that the author focuses exclusively on the life of Mordecai and doesn't even mention Esther, which I find interesting. The life of Mordecai is the focus that we're looking at. Now, if you're taking notes today, you'll notice that in your bulletin, uh, there are three lines there and you got a little space after each line for you to fill in, and you'll see it up on the screen up here. God chose, I think, Mordecai with all of his strengths and his weaknesses to accomplish his plans. What was Mordecai like? What kind of a person was he? So we're, we're going to be discovering Mordecai's character. What type of a father was he? What type of friend was he? What was he like to live with every day? How did he treat his friends? What was he like in public? Well, verse 3 says that he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers. For he sought the welfare of his people and he spoke peace to all his people. In other words, Mordecai at this point as the second below the king in power, 
for the Persian Empire watched out for the needs of the Jewish people. The, the Persian Empire was the largest empire that had ever existed at that time. It was larger than everything. It, it uh, started from the Indus River Valley in India, extended all the way across to Iran, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, all the way over to the western side of Turkey at the Bosphorus Strait. All of that. It included also the land of Israel. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we find that uh, he's in charge of all of these things, the Jewish people, but also all of the other things that were taking place all across the empire. Well, earlier in the book, Mordecai is introduced to the reader as one who took in the daughter of his uncle because her mom and dad had died. We don't know how they died, uh, just that they had. So here he is um, taking in this young girl. Why did he do that? Well, because it was part of the Jewish custom, part of Jewish law, that if a relative fell on hard times, a close relative was responsible for caring for the needs of that particular person. We see that very clearly stated in the book of um, Ruth, where uh, she um, asked for help from a close relative. So here he is raising this young girl. He takes her in because she has nowhere else to go, and he raises her. What kind of a dad was he? Well, I think he was an exceptional father because we see that as Esther grows into adulthood and she moves out of his house, she still comes back and she consults him about what to do in her life. Here's the queen of the empire coming to ask this fellow who's raised her how she should react in certain situations. And she respected him. So he must have done a good job as dad, I'm guessing. Secondly, we find that as we read through the story, he refused to bow down to Haman as a sign of worship, <clears throat> as this would have violated Jewish law that required that only God be worshiped. You probably remember the story of, of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of uh, Daniel, where they were asked to bow down to this image. And they said, we can't do that. We can only bow down to God. And so that's what took place in that situation. And um, thirdly, he entreats Esther to approach the king on behalf of the Jewish people, that God's people might not suffer annihilation. Well, I think these actions really speak to his character in a number of ways. We find that he sought to follow the Jewish law. This was one of the, man, the, the basic mandates that God gave to his people, the Jews. I am giving you this law, and I want you to obey this law. And their problem was that they didn't, and they got themselves into the problem where this story takes place. <clears throat> so he's a godly man. He respects and honors God. As the second in command of the empire, we find that he continues to protect the Jewish people. It's, it's fascinating to me to see how God uses people to accomplish his purposes. He uses all of us, and it's our job to make ourselves available. We see it in this story. Probably God's main instrument in working in this world is through the human race and through people like you and me. Our job is to make ourselves available to God like Mordecai did. Well, let's go, um, yeah, maybe I got, did I get myself mixed up here? No, okay, here we go. Let's go to the second point regarding Mordecai. And this is number two uh, in your outline there, observing Mordecai's actions. Well, even though this book is entitled the book of Esther, Mordecai really is the force behind the written narrative. He is the one 
who brings Esther to the capital city, Susa, as a little girl, which in turn makes her, I guess, available when uh, the king is looking for a new wife and they go out and they look for all these young women. She's right there in the capital. And she becomes one of those young women who goes into his court. It's Mordecai's action in, dis, in the disobeying of the king and not bowing down to Haman that started the plot to destroy the Jews. Can you imagine the guilt that Mordecai must have been under to find out that his action, he thought he was doing something right, yeah? He was obeying God by not bowing down. And now look what happened. All of his people are now under a death sentence. Poor guy. And he is the one who encourages Esther to go before the king to plead for the lives of their countrymen. You see, it was death for a person to come into the king's court without him asking them to come. This was apparently one of the laws of the land, that if you came before the king and he did not hold out that golden scepter to you, you were to die. So you can, you can imagine the fear that's there in, in uh, Esther's heart. She's taking her life in her hands. Well, I think it was, it was Mordecai that was probably also behind the scheme that Esther used of having the, the two different banquets to kind of pique the king's interest and, and you know, get him excited about what it was that she was after. What, what's, she, what's she trying to do here? I think he was in that planning. That's my own opinion on it. And I think he, was, he probably also came up with a suggestion when the king said, well, what do I do? We've got this decree. I can't change it. Here he comes up with the idea of doing a second decree in a certain way. So you see, Mordecai is the instrument that God uses to, drink, to bring about most of the things that take place in this story. Once again, though God is never mentioned in the book, it's clear that he is the ultimate power behind the events that protected his people. He's really using Mordecai for his purposes. And number three, honoring Mordecai's stature. Mordecai is the second in power in the greatest empire that had ever been up to that time. Some folks let power and popularity go to their head. Not Mordecai. In fact, it's Mordecai and Esther that instigate a day of remembrance when the people of Israel are saved. The earliest extra-biblical account that we have, and that means from a source outside of the Bible, is uh, a of the celebrating of this particular event that we're talking about, is found in a book called 2 Maccabees, chapter 15. Maccabees is one of those books that you will find between the Old Testament and the New Testament in a Catholic Bible. Protestants, at, at, when they were putting together the canon for the Protestant church, they didn't feel that those particular books were up to the same literary standard as the other books that we find in our Bible today. So they excluded them. But the Catholics decided, no, we're going to include those books in there. So that's one of the books, Second Maccabees. And it says in, in uh, chapter 15, verse 55, they called it the day of Mordecai. So this festival that they came up with, or this remembrance was called the day of Mordecai, not, not the day of Esther, it was the day of Mordecai. Well, looking at all these things that took place, it's not hard to understand why in Maccabean times, the feast was called the day of Mordecai. Not only is he honored, as we read, in his lifetime, and he's very popular, he's remembered centuries after his death with a day of feasting known as Purim. Now, Purim's not an English word. Uh, I believe it's a Hebrew word. Um, let me break it down here for a minute. Pur means 
lot. Or I guess to be similar for us, it'd be, it'd be dice. You know, you throw the dice um, in whatever you're doing. The I am at the end is the plural of poor, which is referring to many throws of the dice. So, so what does this have to do with what we're talking about here? Well, if you, if you remember uh, the story Treasure Island, I used to be fascinated by that story as a child, Robert Louis Stevenson. He talks about this thing called the black dot. Do you remember that? If you got the black dot, it's over for you. It was a piece of paper, round piece of paper like this, black on one side, and then on the other side, you turn it over and it would tell you what your fate was gonna be. So as it relates to our story here, when it refers to lots, it's referring to the demise of Haman being hanged on his own gallows and his 10 sons also being hanged on that same gallows. So that's what it means. And now almost 2,400 years later, the Jews are still celebrating these events as they observe the Feast of Purim. Well, let's take a few moments to look at the Feast of Purim. What, what does it look like today? What do they include? What do they do uh, in this particular festival? Well, there are many variations to it, depending on where you live in the world and what, what your culture is. Um, there are many variations, but there are five basic things that take place in Ellie's every celebration. And the first one is that if you're part of this, you're expected to dress up in some kind of a costume. Doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. Kind of like when you go to a costume party or, or you dress up for a parade. Second, um, there is reading of the Megillah or the scroll that takes place. Esther is referred to by the Jews as, the book of Esther, as the scroll or the Megillah. It's one of five scrolls in the Old Testament that are referred of the same way. The book can be read um, all at once or it can be read um, uh, in different parts throughout your celebration. Next, people give uh, money or food to charity, to people in need, and this can be done in a variety of different ways. And then you are expected to send gifts of food to your friends. Now, if you've got really good friends, people you really like, you, you know, you'll, you'll buy them something that's really special that they can't afford normally. Um, whatever that might be. And if you got another friend and you know, you're kind of so-so friends with them, you send them a fruitcake. <laughs> well, um, it has all kind of culminated in this big feast that they have or dinner that they prepare. I remember when I was young, way back, um, we used to have these big Sunday dinners. Some folks still do this. You know, all week you'd have your regular food, but on Sunday, mom would start, get up early in the morning and start cooking and have a special meal, whether it's lobster or steak or whatever, that we would not, we could not afford and, and did not have regularly during the week. Well, that's, that's what they do at this time. And you can go online and there are special recipes for kosher meals and kosher foods that you can, you can make specifically for this event. Well, the celebration takes place on what's called the 13th of the month of Adar in the Jewish calendar. It, uh, it, it equates to March, April time frame for us. It's kind of like our, our Easter service. You know, it falls in March or April, but every year it changes. So it's the same way with Purim. Now, there's several other traditions that usually are practiced. The week before uh, the celebration, on the Sabbath, they, in the synagogue, have an Old Testament reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, where it talks about the destruction of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were a people that, as the nation, the Jewish nation, was coming in the Exodus out of Egypt up to the Holy Land, this 
people that lived in this local area just attacked the people of Israel without provocation. And so they became a very hated people to the Jews because they were killing them. So how does this connect in? Well, Haman was a descendant of the Amalekites. And so he fit right in there. They hated Haman because he was Amalekite and because he had done all of these things. So they have that reading. Now, the day before the festival, there is a day of fasting. If you remember back in the story, before Esther goes before the king, she says to Mordecai, please, you and your friends, take three days and fast because this could be the end of me if I go before the king and he doesn't recognize me. So we have a day of fasting. It's also traditional to give three half-denomination coins to charity. What does that mean? Well, for us, it would be like a half dollar. You would give three of those to, uh, to charity in the synagogue service uh, that, that they're having at the time. And what this, what this commemorates is a, a custom of giving um, a half shekel to the temple treasury when, when they would come to visit the treasure. It, they had to, got, you know, they got to have money in here somewhere, you know, like we do with our, with our offerings. So, but there were also special prayers that were said during this day. They usually included some portion of uh, the story that we have read and we've studied. And then they also have prayers of thanksgiving following each meal, which I think is kind of, kind of interesting. We, we pray before the meal. Well, they pray after the meal of thank, giving a thanksgiving. Well, as we draw to a close uh, this morning, we should ask ourselves, what are the takeaways from this story, this extraordinary book of the Bible? Why is this book so important? Well, I've jotted down four things. Obviously, there are a lot more that you could pull out of here, but I've got four of them. It teaches that first, God is all powerful. He created the universe, He created everything, and He is the controlling force behind all of the events that take place. He didn't just make the universe and then stand back and let it run itself. He's intimately involved. Second, God's plan for His people continues all throughout human history and into the future. God isn't through with this universe. He's not through with this planet. He's not through with the human race. God's plans are often quite intricate, and they're not visible until the conclusion of the event or maybe much later. Think of a time in your life when you've gone through a really difficult time and you can't understand why God let this happen. And you say, God, why did you let this happen to me? I've been, I've been good. I've, I've done what you've told me to do. And yet, look, this has happened to me. Well, those of us who are a little older can look back on our lives, and often we can say, now I understand why that particular thing took place in my life. It had to happen so this other thing could happen. This story is a foreshadow of God's redemptive salvation through Jesus Christ. One of my favorite pastors um, a guy by the name of J. Vernon McGee makes this comparison. Don't laugh. I know I'm old. He makes this comparison between uh, King Xerxes and God's plan or God's actions. He says, because the first decree of the king could not be changed, as we've looked, another decree is issued that permits the Jews to defend themselves. The king's government that initially demanded their execution now defends them. This brings salvation and deliverance to a people who otherwise would have perished. 
This is very similar to what God has done for the human race, and he presents this juxtaposition. He says, a decree has gone out from God to mankind, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the penalty is eternal separation from God. He uses two verses. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, the soul that sins, it shall die. Then Romans 6, 23, the wages of our sin is death. Now, here's the way it works. Although this has not been altered and this penalty stands, it cannot be canceled. God has provided another decree. And we find it in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not die but have everlasting life. Interesting comparison. Well, I'd like to leave you with a poem that expresses one man's understanding of God's providence in his life. And perhaps you've heard this poem before. It's called The Weaver. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colors he weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. Amen. Would you join me in our closing prayer? Our Father, I'm so thankful that um, you've given me the opportunity to share these words, and I thank you that you have provided such insight and wisdom into our lives as humans. And I thank you so much that you, when you created everything there is in our universe, you didn't just kind of let it go on its own, but that you're intimately involved in all aspects of it and particularly with our lives. Help us to trust you and to make ourselves available for you to work through us to accomplish your plans for the salvation of each soul. We pray in your name. Amen.
accept this benediction. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not die, but have everlasting life. What a great God we serve. May you go in peace. Thank you for coming.